good afternoon, and uh, <clears throat> we're delightful that so many of you are here, given the inclement nature of, of the weather. Uh, we're very extremely fortunate today uh, to have two uh, pioneers in the field of uh, genomic uh, testing, genetic testing, uh, an, an area of enormous interest importance and uh, problems, which will be discussed uh, today. Uh, I would like to bring to your attention a remarkable book on the subject, uh, The Gene by Siddhartha Mukherjee, who, who wrote the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, book on uh, cancer, The Emperor of All Maladies. Uh, being a liver doctor at heart, and not a geneticist, I found this a remarkable book to read, both for the drama, uh, the intellectual excitement, and the extraordinary quality of, of the writing. And one of the things that uh, Dr. Mukherjee emphasizes are the challenges that uh, emerge and have become accelerated, of course, since the uh, Human uh, Genome Project. And what I'm referring to uh, are the big questions that arise that expand into different areas ranging from uh, the bad, the eugenic movements on, on one hand, to the incredibly challenging uh, concepts uh, as illustrated by gene editing for altering not only genes, but even conceivably altering heredity, influencing the very nature of man. And of course, one of the most exciting and dramatic aspects of this has been the relationship of uh, high-speed uh, genetic uh, sequencing and, and mapping uh, to human disease. Uh, and it raises many questions uh, from the more bench scientific analytical point of view uh, to the clinical and some ethical aspects, privacy, and all of that. Uh, and this is a movement that's in turmoil, not in turmoil, but in, in a, it's in, in a great deal of, of movement and uh, the answers and all will unfold for, with time. So our speakers today, the first speaker is uh, Bob Nussbaum. Uh, uh, Bob uh, graduated from the Harvard-MIT uh, uh, joint program and then did a residency in medicine at Washington University in uh, St. Louis. Uh, a fellowship in genetics at Baylor. Uh, he came to the NIH uh, where uh, he, he was the chief of the medical genomics and <clears throat> the chief of, not the medical genomics, Bob was uh, chief of the genetic disease research branch. Excuse me, I lost the nomenclature. Uh, of the National Human Genome Research Institute. Uh, he's the co-discoverer uh, of the first, I believe, uh, genes involved in the etiology of Parkinson's disease. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, he left the NIH to become a professor of genetics at uh, UC San Francisco uh, where he worked very hard to establish a program in human genetics, and then more recently uh, has joined uh, a uh, company in uh, uh, San Francisco, uh, which he will uh, tell us about, Invitai. Invitai? Invitai. Invitai, where he's the chief medical officer. Uh, we're really very excited that Bob is here for part of uh, the Genome Research Institute meetings and was able to take the time and the willingness to uh, 
speak to us. So Bob is going to talk uh, first, and then the the second uh, speaker is Lance Biesecker, who uh, is chief of the medical genomics and metabolic genetics branch uh, at the National Human Genome Research Institute. Uh, he received medical training in the University of Illinois in <clears throat> pediatrics in Wisconsin and clinical and molecular genetics at the University of Michigan, uh, and then came uh, to the NIH, uh, where he has done extraordinary work in establishing the etiology and natural history of many uh, genetic uh, uh, diseases, and is very much at the forefront of large-scale sequencing studies, analysis, and the problems and challenges that arise. So we're very grateful to both of you. And Bob, would you Thanks. begin, please? Thank you, Wynn. It's a great, uh, great pleasure to be here, speak to you all. So I'll be talking today about variant interpretation as a major challenge in applying genomics to medicine. And what, what, uh, what do I mean by that? Well, the first is I'd like to just, dis just to give my disclosures that I uh, work at Invitae, and uh, I'm also chair of a rare disease therapeutic area advisory board at Pfizer. When thinking about any kind of a test, and in particular a genetic test, there's a nice framework that was proposed by the CDC Office of Public Health Genomics. This is Muin Curry and his uh, colleagues, where you think about a test in the following four levels. One is the analytic validity. Do you get the right result from the right patient? And there we're talking about the sensitivity of the test, that would be false negative rates, the specificity of the test, false positive rates, in other words, accuracy. The next step that we are concerned with is clinical validity. And what that means is, let's assume that you can find what's there, and I'm gonna address this specifically in the area of sequencing. Let's assume that you can find what's there and you're not finding stuff that's not there, okay? What does what you found mean? How much significance does it have for ultimately for the, uh, for the person in whom you found this variant? What's the penetrance? How predictive is it of the possibility of developing disease or is it diagnostic for the condition the person already has? And that clinical validity piece is what I'm gonna be talking about today. However, it, ha it needs also to be put within the following framework, and that is, let's assume that you find a variant that indeed does have predictive value. How useful is it? And there, what does it mean to be useful? Useful to whom? Useful to the patient? in providing him or her with some information, useful for the doctor in the sense that it helps make a diagnosis, or even more, alters management so that the, the, the physician may do something different because of that result. Uh, does it actually, knowing this piece of information, does it ultimately lead to an intervention that saves lives, improves, improves outcome, uh, which is sort of the highest bar for clinical utility, and it's the one that most, for example, third-party payers apply to thinking about whether they're going to reimburse a genetic test. And then finally, is there value to society in having the test results? What are the ethical issues of, for example, testing for a genetic condition that is, uh, for which there's no intervention and which um, could result in serious, uh, uh, for example, neurodegeneration? Is that a good thing? Is that a good ethical thing to do? Uh, what are the legal and social implications of doing that, that sort of testing? So that's the framework, and I'm going to focus particularly on clinical validity. Okay, so another way to think about clinical validity is what we think of as positive and negative predictive value. In people with a positive test, is a disease present or, or is there increased risk as a result of that positive test? And for negative predictive value, it's the opposite. In people with a negative test, how certain does that uh, work to rule out the disease, or does it uh, tell you that the patient is actually at population level risk as opposed to increased risk uh, because of, of, of having this uh, variant which you've shown they do not have. So these are very approximate numbers, but they're just meant to give you some feeling for what happens when you sequence a person's whole genome. And I want to repeat, these are 
are, uh, are, are um, approximate. Uh, and if so, if you're comparing any person's genome sequence to the reference, these are the sorts of numbers you find. There's about three and a half million single nucleotide variant differences, about 500,000 insertions or deletions. The number that are actually within the gene, including introns, is a little over a million, 300,000. In exons, in the coding part of the genes, or about 2% of the genome, there are about 47,000 single nucleotide variants and almost 6,000 insertion deletions, et cetera. And uh, I should just um, um, repeat that the reference is not a normal sequence. The reference is sort of a consensus. It's a majority rules kind of thing based on how many different sequences we, we find and what is most commonly present at this position, at this position, at this position. Um, and it's, <clears throat> it's what is heavily used and, it, and the, the consensus that's used by all testing companies is what's in NCBI. It's the uh, genome build, either 37 or 38 is pretty much the one that's used by most people. Now, if you find the variant in a gene, in a person, how do you interpret that variant? Well, there's two steps to that interpretation. The first is, if you're testing, let's say, someone who's affected with a disease, is the gene in which you found the variant associated with the development of the disease at all? In other words, is there a gene-disease relationship? And then secondly, if that gene is known, or I should say alterations in that gene are known to cause a particular disorder, is that particular variant that you found one that causes the, the disease, or perhaps is it just a benign difference that's, um, that has no effect on, on uh, phenotype? So here's an example. Two siblings with infantile epilepsy, the result of a consanguineous mating, the filled in symbols are the affected uh, children. And then you've got three other um, siblings who are unaffected. And they were, these were, these, uh, this family was subjected to a whole exome analysis trying to find some gene that could possibly be responsible. And of course, what they were looking for, because it was a consanguineous mating, was they were looking for that the two affected should have the same mutation on both copies, in other words, the same mutant allele on both copies of some gene. That was part of the filter that they were doing. And they did some other filtration as well, based on the fact it was consanguineous. But one of the genes that came up when they did this was a gene called synaptogenin 1. This is the mutation. It's a missense mutation, arginine 258 glutamine. And you might look at that and say, well, why did they settle on that one? Because in fact, there were half a dozen uh, or more uh, missense variants in genes around the genome. But the reason this one was particularly useful and interesting was because we know a lot about synaptogenin. This was a gene that was cloned by Pietro di Camilli. It's a polyphosphoinositide phosphatase. It is uh, implicated in the regulation of endocytic traffic at synapses. In fact, it's involved in the engulfing of neurotransmitters and then the endocytic um, uh, recovery of neurotransmitters back into the uh, axon at the end of a neuron. So if, you, if you're looking at siblings with infantile epilepsy and you find what looks like a reasonable candidate gene uh, whose function at least sort of fits to some extent what might be the case, then this becomes a pretty good candidate. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because whenever you're dealing with a, with a gene and a disease, what are the evidence levels? What do you care about to try to figure out whether there is a good relationship between a particular gene and disease? And these are the levels of evidence that have been proposed by the um, ClinGen uh, Consortium, which is an NIH-funded extramural uh, um, activity uh, that is trying to put together uh, guidelines, criteria, ways of being able to um, assess um, evidence levels of this kind. So, for example, what, is the, uh, what, what would be considered a definitive gene-disease relationship? The role of this gene in this particular disease has been repeatedly demonstrated in both the research and clinical diagnostic settings, has been upheld over time, in general, at least three years. No valid evidence has emerged to contradict the role of the gene in the specified disease. I'm not going to read through all this, but for example, let's look at limited. There's limited evidence to support a causal role for this gene in this disease, such as 
fewer than three observations of a pathogenic variant within the gene, and multiple variants reported in unrelated probands, but without sufficient evidence for pathogenicity. Pathogenicity is a difficult uh, term, which we're going to get to in a minute, but this is a missense mutation, and in fact, chemically, arginine, glutamine, they're not that different as amino acids, and so you might think, you know, I'd say that there is uh, not very strong evidence for this being the appropriate gene, but from a research point of view, the next thing you do is you find other families in which the same phenotype appears, and in fact, that's what was done, and additional families have been identified with a, other variants in the synaptogenin one gene, so that this now has risen to the level of being a moderate to strong gene disease evidence uh, link, it's in the online Mendelian inheritance in man as one of the causes of infantile epilepsy. Okay, so why do I mention this? What evidence is required to include a gene in a clinical report when you do a whole exome like this? Well, it depends on the purpose of the report. If you're trying to do a predictive test or you're finding something in an individual, someone goes in and says, you know, I'm gonna go to this company and get my whole genome sequenced and, um, gee, I found a variant uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in some gene. Um, how, why should I pay attention to that at all? Well, unless you have definitive or really strong evidence, when you're doing a predictive test, someone who has no phenotype, or it's an incidental finding, it's got nothing to do with the reason you were having the initial test, uh, you need very strong evidence before you're going to believe that that gene is actually involved. If it's a diagnostic panel where the patient actually has a condition, then you probably need slightly less uh, evidence. And then finally, if you're doing a whole exome or genome, we're quite willing to accept limited evidence because it points you to what you need to do next, which is find more families, find more uh, people who have mutations in that gene. So the strength of a gene uh, report, uh, gene um, uh, disease correlation, depends on the purpose to which you're doing the, the study. Okay, here's another thing. Now I'm gonna to go to switch to a different uh, uh, issue, and that is a 45-year-old woman with breast cancer. Uh, she's in the bottom there, shown with the arrow, and this is her family history. Uh, she had one uh, paternal aunt who died of uh, chronic uh, lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, her grandfather on her father's side had prostate cancer and died at age 63. Mother has had ovarian cancer at age 73, and she's passed away. This is the family history. She goes and has a hereditary breast and ovarian cancer panel, which consists, depending on what laboratory and how you do it, somewhere between uh, a dozen to as many as 40 different genes may be looked at at the same time. And it turns out she has a missense mutation, C to T, at position 5, in the BRCA2 gene. Now, there is no need to worry about the gene disease correlation for BRCA2. We know that mutations in BRCA2 can cause hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. But her mutation is a missense proline to leucine at position two in the protein, and it is officially described as a VUS, which stands for Variant of Uncertain Significance. What does that mean? Well, for many, many years, uh, I would say that this field had uh, almost no uh, rigor in deciding two different laboratories, and I'll, sh I'll, I'll, I'll show you uh, evidence for this, uh, might look at the same variant and interpret it very, very different way. We didn't have um, a disciplined way to think about variants. So um, back in 2013, a uh, joint committee of the American College of Medical Genetics and the Association for Molecular Pathology, AMP, got together and said, look, first of all, uh, we think that every variant should be classified in one of five levels. The top level is pathogenic, meaning we uh, are quite certain that that variant causes a in significant increased risk for disease. At the bottom is benign. We're quite certain that that variant has no impact on health. And then in between are these three other levels, likely pathogenic, meaning we're almost sure that it's, that it's disease causing and likely benign. We're almost sure that it doesn't cause disease. And then if you can't put them in one of those four slots, 
you're left with what's in the middle, which is a VUS, or variant of uncertain significance. Oh, by the way, what, what do we mean by likely pathogenic and likely benign? That was pulled pretty much out of a hat, decided it was 90%. So likely means that we have a 90% certainty or feeling that it's likely benign or that it's uh, likely pathogenic. Okay, that's the meaning of likely. So this group, uh, AMP and uh, American College of Medical Genetics, um, they didn't just propose five levels. They proposed a system by which any variant could be interpreted and a decision made as to where it fits in this five-tiered system. So what kind of evidence did they say you need to bring to bear on these variants? So population data. Uh, so actually, let's look across the top first, benign. The sorts of evidence that would be on the side of calling a variant benign is either strongly in support of that or just supporting. On pathogenic, they actually have four uh, columns. Everything from supporting, meaning it adds a little bit of evidence, to being very strong, which is on the far side. And as I'll show you in a minute, you need multiple lines of evidence to be able to conclude that a variant fits into one of those five slots. And if you don't have enough of them, it becomes a VUS. So the VUS is almost the default. If you don't know it's benign or likely benign, or you don't know it's pathogenic or likely pathogenic, call it a VUS. And part of the reason for that is that laboratories um, realized in looking back in history, and I'll show you some more data about that in a minute, looking back in history, molecular genetic testing probably overcalled variants. They would, for example, find a variant in a particular patient with a disease, and they'd say, gee, I wonder if that causes a, a problem for this patient, particularly if it's a missense, just an amino acid substitution. So they would gather 50 blood samples from people on the floor around their, around their laboratory where they worked, and that would give them 100 chromosomes, 100 copies of the gene. If they didn't find the variant in those 100, they would say, ha, must be it, we got it, it's the pathogenic mutation. And that was, of course, nowhere near enough evidence to conclude that that variant was pathogenic. So this is an attempt to avoid um, overcalling at the, I think, and I think rightly, at the expense of undercalling. In other words, the laboratories have decided, and I think that this reflects that, that it's better to say I don't know than to say I know and you're wrong. Okay, so what's the kind of the evidence? Population data. So strong on favor of being benign is that the minor allele frequency, which, which up, and up, up until recently was really hard to know. Well, how often is this variant found in the general population? Luckily, between the Thousand Genomes Project, the uh, ESP Project, in, at the University of Washington, and most spectacularly, the EXAC project at, from the Broad Institute, we now have tens of thousands, hundred thousand more um, people who've been sequenced at the exon level, and we can count how often is this particular variant found or not. So, for example, that BRCA2 variant I showed you, it's not in EXAC. It's not in thousand genomes. So, in other words, it's probably pretty rare. Uh, but being rare only gets you a moderate under the pathogenic side, absent or appropriately rare in public databases. So moderate. The next piece of data that they use is computational data, where you might do something like look at its conservation. And I think this is probably something that was over-interpreted in the past. But to say, oh, that's, a, that's the same amino acid that's seen in humans, mice, um, stickleback, chicken, um, xenopus, um, yeast. So if Mother Nature thinks that amino acid needs to be conserved, then it's probably important, and changing it probably affects the function of the gene. That turned out to have been woefully um, naive. So most of the computational approaches do depend upon conservation. They also depend upon the chemical change that a missense mutation is developing, and also have some other uh, it's a built-in uh, um, efforts that are uh, focused around machine learning, feeding 
fairly large data sets of both pathogenic and non-pathogenic or benign variants and allowing the, uh, the computer to learn from these, uh, sort of a neural net approach. Um, but I would say that in general, uh, from a point of view of a clinical laboratory, uh, uh, such as where I work, uh, computational data uh, is really um, not, co computational data of that kind is generally not considered very strong data. We don't use it very much. Uh, and in the um, uh, schema from ACMG and AMP, about the only thing that really gives you either strong or very strong pathogenic is if the amino acid change you see is, an, is a known established variant. In other words, people already know from a variety of different data sources that it's disease causing, or that it's a truncating variant that pr produces either truncation or more likely nonsense mediated decay, loss of function, where loss of function of that gene is a known mechanism of disease. So what you're saying is there may be lots of different ways to cause loss of function, but if you know loss of function causes disease, that's very strong. And in fact, that's the only piece of data in this entire schema that fits under very strong. Functional data, uh, uh, so for example, do you know that um, this variant affects the function of an enzyme and that loss of the function of that enzyme uh, is, uh, is involved in the, in the cause of the disease? Uh, you could do that in cell culture. Uh, you could even do it in um, animal models, et cetera. Segregation data, do you have a big family? where you can follow the inheritance of this variant and follow the inheritance of the, of the uh, phenotype and show that it either co-segregates or in fact doesn't segregate. That allows you to split between strong benign versus uh, moderate pathogenic, et cetera. And I, I don't wanna go through all of these, but there's two, there's a couple, there's two that I wanna point out particularly. Under other databases, supporting benign is a reputable database says that this variant is benign. What do you mean by reputable, Kimasabi? I mean, what do you mean reputable? Who says it's reputable? On the other hand, for, uh, uh, if it's a reputable database that says it's pathogenic, note that a reputable database calling it pathogenic only gets you supporting. It's the lowest level, just exactly for that reason. And the other thing I wanna point out to you, which uh, is gonna be the subject of part of what Les is gonna talk about, at the very bottom where it says other data, and this really came in from left field um, because as opposed to every other piece of information here, this is the only piece of information that's actually directed towards the patient, him or herself, and her or his family history. Everything else is literature, computational, what's been seen before in other patients, but that is that the patient's phenotype or family history matches the gene. That's considered supporting for pathogenic. But realize that's a different kind of information than any other piece in this large matrix. Okay, so you go through this and you say, yeah, it looks like um, same amino acid change as an established pathogenic variant. Well, that's strong. Uh, located in the mutational hotspot, well, that's moderate for pathogenic, uh, et cetera. You go through and then you do a scoring system, point system. So the call of variant pathogenic you need one very strong and one strong piece of data, or one very strong and two or more moderate, or, or supporting for pathogenic, et cetera. And you can go through this and you can see that lower and lower levels of d supporting data for pathogenic or supporting data for benign uh, are used to place things into one of those four categories. If those categories don't match one of those four, or it turns out that there's arguments for and against it being pathogenic, you're left with a VUS, uncertain significance. How good are these scoring rules? Well, what do, what, one thing you'd certainly like to know is, do they get it right? And the second thing you wanna know is how consistent is it? If, the same, if, 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 if nine different laboratories were to apply these same rules, do they get the same answer? Well. The first question is actually very hard to answer because how do you, you need an absolute gold standard and you need a gold standard that's not in the public domain, is not in the literature, so people can't cheat and look it up. That's very hard. So instead what I'm just gonna show you is 
consistency. So this was a, this is, I got this data from Gail Jarvik. It's part of the clinical sequence exploratory research group that they, they called it their Bake Off. They looked at 99 variants across nine labs. And they gave them uh, these variants and asked them to classify them. And they looked at both intralaboratory and interlaboratory differences. Intralaboratory meaning two different people in the same clinical laboratory. How did they interpret it? And these are the results. So if everything was perfectly consistent between how the lab classified it and, has it, and how it would be classified strictly applying the ACMG criteria, it would be on this diagonal. And you can see, of course, the majority are on this diagonal. But look at ACMG class VUS, all right? That's this um, uh, horizontal row. Two labs called it pathogenic, six called it likely pathogenic, 94 called it a VUS, 17 called it likely benign, and four called it benign. So in other words, all over the map. So it's not just one step away. We're talking about the entire spectrum of possibilities. So it's quite clear that um, even applying these criteria, there's still room for variability in how variants are being interpreted. So what do we do about this? Well, what happens, I think, in medicine, when there's some disagreement as to the meaning of a particular finding, such as an image on an MRI, or an elevation of a particular blood uh, analyte, or a particular variant found on, gene on genetic sequencing, what do you do? You aggregate information. You find out, well, who else has seen this? And what did those patients look like? What was the outcome from those patients? Can we use uh, the um, combined knowledge and intelligence of the entire medical community to try to figure out what to do? So uh, NIH, in its wisdom, uh, funded a uh, grant called ClinVar. I was very happy to have been one of the PIs on that grant before I uh, left to go into industry. And this was run, led by Heidi Rehm from Harvard and David Ledbetter from Geisinger and um, Lisa, I forget her name, I'm sorry, I apologize, uh, also from Geisinger, and Martin. And um, hmm? Krista, Krista Martin, sorry. Krista, if you're listening, I really apologize. I'm sorry. Krista Martin, to chalk it up to my, uh, as a uh, aged moment. Um, and uh, with them, we, uh, we established ClinVar, and the idea was that clinical laboratories, other sources of information, would put their data into a database where they would give the variant, how it was interpreted, and why it was interpreted that way. So that's what the ClinVar is about. Almost immediately after ClinVar was um, established, there was controversy. It became a very hot topic. One of the reasons it became a very hot topic is there were certain laboratories, one in particular, which shall remain nameless, that decided it would not put its variants into ClinVar because it considered its interpretation of these variants to be intellectual property proprietary to them, and they would not share it with anyone. Not only did they refuse to participate in ClinVar, they also started taking pot shots at ClinVar, saying it's unreliable, can't use it for clinical interpretation. Only we have, the, I'm quoting them, only we have the secret sauce that allows you to really interpret variants properly. So ClinVar discords is a very hot topic. There's good, there's bad, and there's pretty ugly. Um, in an attempt to figure out what's going on with ClinVar. So we've done analyses of ClinVar. ClinVar has um, uh, hundreds of thousands of variants um, submitted to it now and are available for analysis. And I want to go through with you some of our findings. So first, we did analysis of just BRCA1 and 2 data. This is from May 2016 download. The analysis was limited to data that met the following objective criteria. The BRCA1 and 2 data had to be submitted by an established clinical lab. It had to be a lab that put over 200 classifications in. In other words, it had to be a lab that was doing this for real. And the entries had to be less than five years old because we know that previous to the ACMG criteria and other sorts of criteria, people were 
um, not as strict about their interpretation. And we, um, we uh, dichotomized the, the um, interpretations into two pots. Pathogenic and likely pathogenic, which we think of as being actionable. You've got to do something about that. And then the other is benign, likely benign, and VUSs, where we don't know what to do about them or we don't think they mean anything and therefore are not actionable. So dichotomized. And these are the results. This is comparing um, six laboratories, of which Vitae is one, and something called SCRP. A sharing Clinical Reports Project. The Sharing Clinical Reports Project was a volunteer effort by me and a bunch of genetic counselors around the country to go to cancer genetics clinics and say, look, we want to know how is Myriad, which had the patent on BRCA1 and 2 until 2013, so they had the patent for almost 20 years, um, uh, how are they interpreting certain BRCA1 and 2 variants? What I want you to do is take a yellow sticky, cover all the identifiable information, and then fax the report to me. And I'll put it into ClinVar. And by doing that, we collected over 7,000 uh, Myriad reports, which otherwise would not be available to the public. And then we asked the question, how often wa was the Myriad interpretation or Anbreeze or Invites concordant with the other laboratories? And the answers were, I mean, if you look at SCRP and Myriad, we're talking about 90, essentially 99% concordant. So the idea that there's something terribly wrong with ClinVar when used in this way for BRCA1 and 2, I just don't think holds water. The concordance rate is very, very high. And of course, there's also, you have to realize that none of these, including Myriad's, constitutes the gold standard. They're all different laboratories doing the best they can to interpret these. Okay. Now, if there are discordances, where are they coming from? So we decided to look at all of ClinVar. And this was a September 2016 data download. And we looked at all unique variants from genes that, that our lab at Vitae currently offers with at least two classifications submitted by established clinical laboratories, including data from Myriad through, through the SCRP. That turned out to be 38,000 total classifications of 14,800 unique variants from 520 genes. What was the discordance rate? Well, first you have to look at the ClinVar entries. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but we pulled out information like sample origin, how was it interpreted, um, uh, uh, how was it, uh, what was the data that supported that interpretation, when was the last time that it was evaluated, what date was it submitted, um, that kind of thing. And here's the results. If you look at all submissions uh, and you um, look at actionable, which is ACT, versus pathogenic. In other words, that they agree that it's either pathogenic, VUS, or BLB. So path means, were you, were you, uh, was your consensus the same for one of those three pots, whereas actionable was, was your consensus the same for the two pots, either uh, PLP or the other. And we looked at all submissions, we looked at hereditary cancer, and blue is complete agreement, and hash mark is there was a majority, the two-thirds or more of the laboratories that submitted agreed. So you can see in hereditary cancer, um, the, uh, uh, the concordance rate was upwards around 98% uh, for majority consensus, and complete agreement was about 96%. And it varies depending on, your, on, on the area. And in particular, look at cardiology, which is the fourth one over, it is less consistent than others, and there's, there's reasons for that that we can talk about later. But this is basically over all of ClinVar as of September 2016, uh, what the majority was and what the complete agreement was. What was the source of the discordances? So what's on shown you uh, here is the discordance rate on the left-hand side on the y-axis. The clinical testing labs in green way less than 1%, we're talking about 96, uh, uh, we're talking about 0.5 or 0.4% discordances. If you look at ones that were in the literature, the discordance rate jumps up to almost 8%, et cetera. Research labs are, are less than literature, but uh, not as concordant as clinical testing. 
and across the bottom are a bunch of different uh, places. The Les's lab, uh, he's been submitting in Clinvar, like, like, like the good citizen that he is, and you can see that his discordance rates are actually quite low and quite comparable to that of uh, the uh, clinical testing laboratories. And of course, as he'll tell you, he is delivering clinical results. Here's the concordance by date of submission. You can see that anything that's in ClinVar from 2010 and before, the concordance rates are, um, are much uh, lower and that they improve over time. Concordance by category, that's the, 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 that's the uh, curved line, not the bar graph. The bar graph is total number of submissions. The uh, line graph is the uh, discordance rates. You can see the discordance rates fall as you get more and more modern um, interpretations. By category and date, all submissions, clinical testing, and clinical testing since 2014, where the bulk of ClinVar submissions are, you can see that we're up quite high. We're talking about 97, 98% across all clinical areas. Um, I'll skip this one because it's not that interesting. But um, I just wanted to once again comment on the fact that this one area of patient's phenotype or family history matches gene, um, I'm setting less up to talk about this more because uh, he and a, a group in ClinGen, of which I am a part, have really been doing, I think, some really interesting work in trying to figure out how does one use patient's phenotype in the interpretation of a variant. And with that, I'm going to stop and switch over and hand this over to Les. And then we'll have questions at the end for both of us, if that's OK. Is that all right? Yeah. OK. I want to take uh, that forward uh, from Bob's awesome talk and talk a little bit about where we're going. And I want to push you all a little bit. And I will stress you a little bit because there is a bit of math involved here. And don't freak out. It'll be OK. And really, what I want to do is key off of this idea that Bob focused on, which is separating out and thinking more clearly about doing two different things. One is determining the pathogenicity of a variant, which is a separate thing from making a molecular diagnosis in a patient because the first one can be independent of any individual patient, and the second one is very much coupled to the individual patient, and exactly how you do that matters a lot, and your thinking needs to be clear. And so really what we need to do is distinguish pathogenicity from diagnosis by determining what is known or knowable about the variant, that is, the, our knowledge set, and Bob talked about that, and ClinVar and other sources about where do we go to learn about this variant so that we can make an assertion as to whether or not it is validly associated with a disease pathogenicity. Then the next step is you, if you may go forward to use that determination, and it may not necessarily be limited to variants that you know are pathogenic, by the way, and this will come up later. But use that variant to make a diagnosis or not. And then, as Bob said, use that variant to make a change in management or not. And each of those steps is a separate decision that you have to make. And part of the problem that Bob outlined relates to really the, our, the crux of the challenge for our entire field today. And when you're talking about that nice ACMG colored grid, this is a highly dimensional problem. That is, there are a lot of independent factors that go into these assertions. And I think it's fair to say, almost, that every single variant has a slightly different mix of data, data types, and data strength that go into the determination of pathogenicity. And so that is a very challenging situation. It isn't a unidimensional problem where you measure an attribute of a thing and you say it's okay or it's not okay. This problem is very dimensional. Every one of those factors you saw on that color chart have associated underlying uncertainty with them. And for some of them, we know the uncertainty. But for others, we actually don't even know how certain or uncertain we are about the knowledge that underlies those different 
uh, pathogenicity factors. The heterogeneity of the data, very different kinds of data, and you can talk about functional assays are a criterion. Well, you, uh, I bet there's enough basic scientists in here who will immediately recognize a functional assay for gene one is a completely different kettle of fish than it is for gene two, than it is for gene three, and, and you just can't, it's very hard to generalize across those. The other thing we have to be very careful about, which I made the point earlier, is thinking clearly and um, uh, rationally about implications and what the information is going to be used for. And I'm advocating for separating out the utility equation and considerations from pathogenicity considerations. If you allow that to stir back in, you get into some pretty weird circular reasoning loops and it can really muddle your thinking about different questions. And then there are, there are values actually, which is kind of like that last uh, E, the ethics component of this. We, and we all have a slightly different mix of values and a lot of that actually re relates to what errors we are tolerant of and what errors we are not tolerant of. And in medical decision making, that is where it gets really hard really fast and why different clinicians do different things with the same clinical scenario and why different patients will want different things done to them in objectively similar scenarios because there are underlying values that differ in those situations and people assign different relative weights to those values and that leads to different decisions being made and that really complicates things. So if you have a problem that has all these attributes, what in the world do you do? One, one thing is to you know, just you know, run around screaming and panic or you can start to actually approach it rationally. And so if you have a highly dimensional problem, the approach is you break it down into its components and deal with one component at a time. That's what that table is from the ACMG. Uncertainty. Uncertainty has to be measured and addressed in everything that we do and factored into the uh, confidence and the strength of the assertions at the end of the process. So we <clears throat> must uh, incorporate that. Heterogeneity of data, we have to figure out how to objectively measure data strength and types and figure out how to weight the evidence correctly. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, based on that uh, evidence. As I said before, decoupling from utility I think is critical. And then in values, we have to preserve professional judgment and preserve patient input into decision making at the right point and the right time and the right way in these processes to be sure that those factors do get in. Even though I'm going to argue for a very objective mathematical approach to this problem, these things always matter and have to come in at the end at the right time. Now, uh, this thing about errors, I think, is very interesting. And it is one of the things in our field that people hate to talk about. And it is almost like our friend Voldemort here. We're not even allowed to say its name. But errors have to be approached in a very direct fashion. And the question you have to ask is, what error in the particular situation you're working in are you willing to tolerate? And what error will you make if you don't use a genomic approach? Because one of the criticisms of genomics, you see this, uh, this uh, worry that Bob um, went over about, uh, oh my goodness, not everybody agrees about the pathogenicity of the variant. Therefore, you genetics people, you don't know what you're doing. Therefore, it's bad. But then you say, well, okay, maybe the data are imperfect. Maybe the estimates are imprecise. And maybe they're still better than practicing without them at all, okay? But it, again, it depends on what error you wanna make and you have to decide. Now here is the most boring thing I'm gonna to present today. Everybody here has seen this two by two table. Everybody learned, was taught it in multiple classes and nobody likes it or remembers it, but it is the most important thing that you have to think about when you're doing this. And the different errors that are on this table are inescapable and you can't just complain about them or wring your hands, you have to actually decide, okay, I want to make more of this error and less of that error. And we, we can do this rationally. I think the best example of this is newborn screening. It's been very clearly laid out program. 
where our field made a very deliberate decision of the kind of error they want to make. And the error that we are comfortable with in newborn screening is that we have a very high false positive rate in order that we have a high sensitivity. All right, so our positive predictive value is terrible in newborn screening. Lots of kids are, have abnormal newborn screens, turn out not to have those diseases, and that's okay. And it's okay because we have decided that that's the error we wanna make. Now you can argue for and against making that kind of an error assessment when you wanna do something like genomic screening. If you wanna do cancer susceptibility screening, what error do you wanna make? Well, most people would probably say you don't want a high positive, you don't wanna make a high, have a high false positive rate. What you really wanna do is maximize your positive predictive value and make the rational choice that you are going to sacrifice sensitivity because that's what you have to do with an imperfect system. So when you're talking about secondary variants, you're gonna go for high positive predictive value and you're gonna change how this table works for your variants. And when you're diagnosing a patient with a disease like the case that Bob showed with the epileptic encephalopathy in the kids, you are going to be more tolerant of overdiagnosing that patient and making a diagnosis uh, because you're going to make a less severe error if you're wrong in that scenario. So those are different trade-offs. So uh, Bob went through this. He also went through this. Really important to understand what this is and what it isn't. What it is, is a pseudo-quantitative, nonlinear, asymmetric, categorical, seat of the pants estimate of the probability that a variant is associated with disease. Just, and I say that not to disparage it, but just to be that we're all 100% clear on what it is and what it's not, okay? And so the asymmetry is interesting. Um, the, uh, the, actually, this should be 0 .1 on the right, not 0 0.05. But notice that the 0 0.001 is not symmetric with the 99 on the other end. So kind of an odd and interesting thing. And then that big thing in the middle, this VUS thing, uh, which is a whole uh, other topic. But importantly, I think it's right because it fits with human decision-making behavior, which is that people tend to push probabilities to extremes in order to allow themselves to make decisions. And when probabilities are in the great middle, people find it hard to make decisions. It's a great story. Has anyone read Nate Silver's book, uh, Signal and the Noise? He has a great story about uh, the Weather Channel used to um, uh, give forecasts that there was a 50% chance of rain. And when they did surveys, they found out that people hated it when they forecast a 50% chance of rain because they couldn't decide what to do. So what did the Weather Channel do? They just push it to you know 30 or 60% because people are happier even though it's not right. It's a wonderful story. Um, read that book, it's a great story about probability. We can't do that in medicine. Oh, it's not just about making the customer happy. Okay, so we're making real pro progress on pathogenicity, and this whole Richards et al. framework is very useful and productive, and it allows us to make improvements. And I think the ClinGen groups that we're working with are going to make short, long, mid, and long-term uh, improvements on it that will make it better. And one of the ways is to take a more formal approach. Now, I'm gonna ask a quiz question from my audience here today. Dr. Nussbaum is not eligible to answer this question. Does anyone know who this is? Anyone? It is not Gregor Mendel. Thank you, that was a good guess. All right, it is the Reverend Thomas Bayes. Bayes, B-A-Y-E-S. Why is Thomas Bayes in my talk? Because of this. Does anyone know what that is? Okay, to Bayes' theorem. Okay, Dennis, you have a question. Is there really an instance of where that? Yes, is yes. It's uh, in, in a lab, uh, I think it's at MIT. Yeah, above the doorway of the lab. Isn't that awesome? It's so nerdy, but I love it. All right, now how many of you use this theorem 
to make decisions on a daily basis. One person, Nussbaum does too, he just won't admit it. Okay, all right, so what does this theorem say? It says this. Um, the prob if you want it in English, the math is above, the English is below. The probability of thing A, given that thing B is true, equals the probability of thing B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. Okay, now most of you guys, your headache is now setting in, right? And you're like, oh my God, I can't believe this guy's doing formulas and stuff. All right? You actually know this, you actually practice this, and you actually believe this. And um, one of the things I'd like to do, uh, would you help me? Okay. I, I brought with me today two gift bags. Okay. I'm from and In them are beans from my kitchen. All right. One of them, I won't say which one, has all pinto beans in it. And one of them ha has a mixture of 50% Pinto beans and 50% black beans. Lots of them, I, the number's big enough that it doesn't matter what the number is. So would you like to pick one of the bags? Okay, now what you I don't want you to do is look. Don't look. But I want you to reach in the bag, and you can do it from your chair if you'd like, or standing. Reach in the bag and pull out one bean. It's a brown bean. All right, now remember, she has what probability of holding the bag with all brown beans and what probability of holding the bag with half and half? 50-50 when she started. She pulled out a brown bean. Now what is the probability that she's holding one of those two bags? You don't have to calculate it. Is it the same? Is it higher that it's brown or it's higher that it's the mixed bag? Who, who thinks it's the same? It's the same, you think it's the same. Who thinks the probability that it's all brown has gone up? Who thinks that it's probability that it's brown and black has gone up? Okay, you all know that theorem because you just used that theorem, okay? Would you pull out another bean? It's another brown bean. Right. Now, what's happening? The probability that it's the all brown bag is going up, staying the same, or going down. All right, now pull out a whole bunch. Pulled out like a half a dozen more brown ones. Which bag is it now? Okay, it, are you sure it's the brown all brown bag? No, but your probability went up, okay? Thank you very much. You can sit down. That's, that's it. Yeah. And we're not, we're not, thank you, Rock. Okay. All right. So that is, and what it is, is we assigned a prior probability to the event, which was which bag she picked. And then what did she do? She took out a little bit of evidence at a time that tested that hypothesis because it could give two different answers. The answers, the, the uh, incremental evidence was actually not itself determinative of the answer, but it changed your assessment of what that previous probability, that prior probability was, and it pushed you in one direction, okay? That is exactly what that ACMG mutation framework is doing in a pseudo-quantitative categorical uh, way, okay? So I'm going to skip through these slides. All right. So we can actually use this approach, the Bayes theorem, and what you will now know is Bayesian reasoning, to think about a quantitative way to do this. So you can assign a prior probability of pathogenicity to a variant, which is dependent on how much of the genome you've searched. It should not be dependent on the person whose DNA you were rummaging around in. It should be independent of that, and that gets to Bob's point. And then you modify that based on different kinds of evidence about the variant. You're going to pull out beans out of the biological knowledge bag to test the hypothesis. Is this piece of evidence about this variant, does it suggest it's pathogenic, or does it suggest it's not pathogenic? And every time you do that, just like how she pulled out one bean at a time out of the bag, 
your probabilities are going to shift one way or another. This is how Bayesian reasoning works. So what do you do? How do you do this? So you can make a ballpark estimate if you sequence the genome based on those numbers that Bob showed you earlier. You can ballpark estimate that each individual harbors on, on in the range of, on the order of 100 variants that are probably pathogenic for a Mendelian disorder. And since we know how many variants the average person has, I can therefore say if I sequence your genome and I randomly select one variant from your genome, knowing nothing about it, what's the likelihood that that variant is pathogenic for a Mendelian disorder? We can calculate that and estimate that. Not that hard to do. Then let's say I want to take out a beam of knowledge about that variant. Right? Well, so let's say, ah, that variant is in an exon of a gene. Now, you all know, I would assume, that a variant selected from a gene is more likely to be pathogenic for a disease than is a variant selected from an intergenic non-coding region of the genome. Right? You can actually measure that probability and you can make estimates of it. So if your prior probability is about 3 times 10 to the fifth, you can say, well, about 95% of variants that are pathogenic for Mendelian disorders are actually in exons. And only about 1.5% of the genome is exons. So you can use those two things. Those are two brown beans that tell you that if your variant is in an exon, it shifts the likelihood that it's benign or pathogenic. And it shifts it towards pathogenic, and you can measure how much it shifts it. Okay, so there's one bean. Then you could pull out another bean. You could say, ah, I looked in exac, and I find out that this variant is extremely rare. Doesn't matter what the threshold is, but it's very rare. And I actually can measure that 90% of variants that are known to cause Mendelian disease are that frequency or rarer in populations. And that all of the variants in the genome, when you look at them, only 25% of variants are that rare because most of them are much more common than that. So then there you go. It's another bean you have pulled out that tells you, ah, this is a rare variant. Rare variants are more likely to cause disease than our common variants. Therefore, it shifts the likelihood that that variant that I pulled out of his genome is caused of a disease. And now we're at about 0 0.0075 is your probability that that variant is pathogenic, which is just, uh, which is actually in the likely benign category from the ACMG criteria. So now I have enough evidence, and it's quantitative, to say that is a likely benign variant. Now you can do this with many different kinds of evidence. And let's just imagine, because I don't want to drag you through a whole bunch of calculations, that you've done all of these calculations, and you come to the end of the line, and your variant comes out as having a 0.88 probability of being pathogenic. That is at the upper end of the range of the variant of unknown significance. So you're in that big pink middle. Now what do you do? Okay. So let's say now is when the phenotype comes in. Now you can use your patient's phenotype as a bean. So let's imagine that the probability is 0.88. And what you're going to do, you're going to look at the patient. Your variant is in a gene called PMS2. And you look at your patient, and you look at his chart, and it turns out it's a 44-year-old man who's had multiple polyps removed and three relatives died of colon cancer before the age of 60. Okay, so now you have a good piece of evidence, and you're seeing some connection to the gene. And so you do this again. And you say, okay, I start at 88.88, and let's just say I'm ballparking this, don't hold me to these numbers, that if you have a pathogenic variant in PMS2, 50% or more of people are going to have that kind of a history. There's a way to score histories to basically count the burden of cancer in families. We use these all the time. And you could also say, given a person who doesn't have a variant in this gene, what's the likelihood that they, or someone off the street would have that kind of a family or personal history of disease? It's pretty low. It would be only a few percent of people. And you do this again. You run your calculation, and now your variant is at 0.992.
So now what you have done is you've objectively taken the phenotypic evidence from the patient separately from what you knew about the variant to say, even though I only knew that much about the variant, given what's going on in my patient, that changes the probability that that variant is pathogenic and raises it up to the level where, as a clinician, it would be very reasonable for you to decide to move forward and take medical action based on that variant. But you could also imagine a different story. So again, let's imagine that the probability came out as 0.88. You look at the patient, and now this is a 74-year-old man who has no polyps, has not had colon cancer, and doesn't have a family history of such. So now, you, again, you started at 0.88, but now your, your probabilities are flipped because you're, the bean you pulled out is a bean that's telling you to push towards benign, not pathogenic. Because if you haven't had colon cancer by the time you're 74 or, or any tumors, you're very unlikely to have that disease. And so your probability drops. And this is a person where you might say, this does not rise to the level of something that would allow me to change his or her care. And the benefits of thinking this way is that it separates our prior and our conditional probabilities. It also prevents us from double counting data. Because the big danger and one of the current flaws or fallacies in our field, I think right now, is that we are using phenotype data of the people we're sequencing multiple times and counting the evidence over and over again for the same thing. And of course, in any rational system, you would all say, you can't do that. You're only allowed to take a, one piece of evidence and count it once, all right? So what do we do now? Unfortunately, our current system is that the phenotype of the patient determines what genes the, the bioinformatician is even looking at when they analyze the genome. So right out of the gate, you're having a biased interpretation of the genome directed by information that is precluding other hypotheses that you should be considering, but you lose, okay? The, the quantitative approach that we're thinking about here is highly amenable to automation. I'll have more to talk about that later. And it gets us out of the seat of the pants informal um, guessing about what variants are, even though it does work pretty well. And I don't want to disparage the Richards at all ACMG criteria because they are useful and they are an improvement but they, formalizing it will make it better. And it does allow us, the wonderful thing about Bayes' theorem is that uncertainty in data, you do not have to bracket your estimates of either the prior probabilities or the uh, conditional probabilities with uh, uh, confidence intervals. It, it's built into the system that estimates are acceptable and that the uh, answer comes out the same with or without those. The downsides are, like most of you didn't raise your hand, most of people don't actually think they are Bayesian reasoners. Uh, in fact, and that has been beaten out of most of us, any of us who took statistics. We were all beaten over the head with Fisherian statistics uh, in all of our graduate and professional training. And Bayes was, if we were lucky, he got part of one lecture in our statistics course. Uh, but it is uh, changing, and I think really it, what will happen is, is this will rise back up. I did a PubMed on uh, using the search string Bayes, and I got about 37,000 hits. And it's stunning how this is coming back into our field now, so we're all going to be doing this. And really, like, like all of you with the little beans, if you go into a, a medical center and you ask, anybody in that medical center, who's the best diagnostician in the medical center? And you go to them and you ask them how they diagnose patients. They are always either overtly or not consciously using Bayesian reasoning. William Mosler was a great diagnostician because he understood implicitly this kind of reasoning. That's how it works. You have a hypothesis, you take a piece of evidence, you modify it. That's what the differential diagnostic paradigm actually is. It's a Bayesian reasoning scheme. Heavens knows why we have never described it that way. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, the other issue is that today, uh, I gave you some examples that made it look like we have quantitative probabilistic 
conditional uh, information for all of these criteria? We actually don't. And much of our data isn't in a quantitative framework and we have to work to get it there in order to allow it to be operated on. So really, what I think the future is here is that we need to separate pathogenicity from diagnosis. We have to rebuild, re-engineer the process so that there is a basic extract of clinical data from the electronic medical record or electronic healthcare record that goes to the laboratory that feeds and, and starts the sequencing process where data are generated. And then what we want to have happen is a semi-automated Bayesian analytic pipeline that operates on every variant in the genome of a patient. I do think that we will eventually go to whole genome interrogation routinely. It's going to end up being cheaper and more efficient in the long run. We're not there yet. But we don't want to do the thing that we're doing now where we only look at a few dozen or a few hundred genes in a sequence. We want to look at all of them, have the computer analyze all of them and give us a set of probabilities that then clinical decision support tools can be designed and implemented such that a probability can lead to a clinical decision support flag that will tell a clinician, just as Bob said, okay, in this patient, based on their sequence data, you need to ask this patient a very careful history about how many people in their family had colon cancer. And you'd be shocked how infrequently we have those data in a clinical chart. That's what we will want it to do. And then iterative clinical decision support analyses will occur over the lifetime of the patient. But it's really important to understand I'm not advocating for complete automation of this process. I do not think that we will ever get to complete automation. It will always be at the end of the day, the person in the laboratory will have to look at the sum of the data and make a judgment as to whether they think the assertions are correct or not correct, justified or not justified, that will always require a human at the end of the day to sign off on those reports. And it will always require a knowledgeable clinician to take that clinical data and say, either that makes sense for this patient, I'm not going to use that for their care, or to look at the data and say, nope, given what I know is going on with my patient, that is not going to be used to change the care of my patient for the following reason. So automation will never be the answer. And I think one of the things I love, uh, one of my favorite things about automation in quotes is that uh, I, th I think it was said that uh, computers don't allow you to make fewer errors. They allow you to make errors faster. Okay. My, my second favorite one is this one. A computer lets you make more mistakes faster than any invention in history with the possible exception of handguns and tequila. <laughs> and we'll stop. We don't, there's an error we don't want to make, okay? And then for any of you who think this is even mildly interesting, much more fun than listening to me talk is to read this book. It's absolutely fascinating. History of Bayes' Rule, how it survived outside of science for almost a century. Uh, and then came up through, actually, interestingly, um, uh, actuaries have been using Bayes' rule for decades. Uh, and then um, the Enigma machine, um, I'm blanking on his name, Turing. uh, Alan Turing's uh, computer. The movie made it look like it was all about the spinning machine. Really, Turing's genius was that he used Bayesian reasoning to crack the Enigma code. It wasn't the computer that did it. It was the uh, reasoning that did it and all the other different applications of how you use Bayesian reasoning in everyday life. So I'll stop there and thank you. Th those of us who are faced with, you know, high dimensionality data, you know, have been, have been encouraged uh, to head straight for principal component analysis, mm -hmm. right, which is the, 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 the classic here. Um, but as I think about this, it seems to me that we might need a lot more practical experience about which of these dimensions, you know, to ultimately wring predictive information using, out of this using PCA, we're going to need a huge data set. Do you understand PCA? And what's the answer to that question? It's, yeah, I, 
I don't I don't think that I'm enough of a statistician to be able to address that address that question. Um, well, I'm so not either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. I yeah. I think. I bet it would be useful, but maybe not yet. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't actually know if it can actually handle different kinds of data, right? I know that we put in a bazillion variants into PCA, and yeah. we can get ethnogeographic oh, oh, yeah, components sure. out, right? Sure. But whether you could put functional data you, in, and then population yeah. frequency data, and um, so evolutionary conversation, con conservation and segregation, I don't know if it can do that. It, That's a great question. It is, very, it is very broadly applicable. It's amazing what PCA can be used for. Mm -hmm. But should look into that. I, yeah, it, I think you're going to need big data sets to actually get it anyway. Thank you. <clears throat> Great talk, both as both as usual. Uh, I um, uh, I've always been bothered by the loss of information when you categorize things like that, because what we're really talking about from benign to pathogenic is a gradient and a continuous gradient. And that was one of my concerns about the bake-off was that it, it uh, overestimated really the error, I think, because things that were 0.02 probability apart may fall on either side of those boundaries. They're really not distinguishable, um, and yet they're categorized differently, and so you call them call that a disconnect, and it's really not. So I guess my, my question is, is there any data? So you do that presumably because that um, those categorizations help whoever's interpreting it in the, in the, in, with the patient um, be able to move forward. Is there any data that that's really true as compared to um, giving them the actual probability with an envelope if necessary? I, I don't know of any actual uh, sort of decision analysis data or psychological data. Um, I can, I have to say, I can just imagine though, um, uh, trying to uh, have a surgeon decide whether they're going to recommend a bilateral mastectomy or not, and you give them a number uh, as opposed to saying, look, if it's likely pathogenic or pathogenic, recommend it. If it's not, don't. And, and so I, I think for, from the point of view of actionability, um, I can just imagine that numbers would, would likely tie people in knots. Definitely. I mean, I mean, so, but I, I've had the situation multiple times where I've gotten, a, let's say, a VUS in the TP53 gene in Leif Romani, where, where it's a, somebody who has no family history and is um, a young woman who, um, who had a breast cancer. And you compare that to almost exactly the same situation, except she had a first cousin with leukemia and another cousin with testicular cancer and a mother with early breast cancer and the same VUS, you're just gonna, you're gonna do a Bayesian reasoning uh, exactly the same way. And so you're gonna end up um, essentially taking that VUS and quantitatively shifting it across the line into the range where you're gonna say, you know what, this is actionable, we ought to do something about it given the family history. Um, but uh, I, you know, I think the question you're asking, Bob, about what, how much data do we actually have on how VUSs are used in the clinic? I don't think we have very much of that data at all. And it's, it'd be really interesting to have. You know, it seems to me this is a lot reminiscent of the days when uh, internists used to go and watch an autopsy or went to a radiologist to see what he was looking at or she looking at on the screen because that was the way in which information flowed from the clinical to the other. Now information flows by the printed word. And <laughs> the printed word has a lot that's lost in the thing. So, I mean, how do you visualize, uh, like Les, you're talking about going to the, the, the patient, to the phenotype and so forth. I, I, I would wonder if in trying to bridge the gap between these sort of things, there's a need to rethink 
how communication takes place between clinical and, in this case, yeah. large numbers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the reason that is really the same question as Bob's, and human beings actually operate on categories. They don't, I mean, I don't think anybody gets in a car and thinks I have a 0.013% chance of dying in a car crash when I, on my way to go get groceries. Nobody thinks that, right? Even though we know what those numbers are. What we do is we get in a car and we decide I'm not gonna die in a car crash so I'm going to the store, right? So what we've done, we put on our, well, there you go. But, but what we've done is taken a probabilistic point, which I think most people know there's some chance, and we've pushed it into a categorical descriptor that we're comfortable with, and we make a decision and we do it. And I think that's your point about the surgeon. The surgeon won't ever, well, they'd probably be paralyzed if we told them the variant had a 93% probability of accounting for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer susceptibility. Give me a fresh. Yeah, and so, you know, it, it, one of the things I would say, it, it, it's my old saying about there's two kinds of people in this world, Bob, people that divide things into categories and people that don't. Everyone does it. And actually, I just wanted to follow up with one other thing, uh, uh, not, more of a cultural issue, which is, you know, as more and more laboratory testing is being done in laboratories that are actually not in the academic medical center or being sent off from private doctor's laboratories, the amount of clinical information being provided to those labs is very, very limited. I mean, sometimes you just get a, a scribbled breast cancer and you, you, don't, you don't know what the family history is. You don't even, there's very little, you don't know even if it's ductal or lobular breast cancer. And so there, you know, at the time you've described the pathologist or the laboratory person, the clinician, would exchange information and enrich each other's ability to do, actually do a Bayesian calculation uh, from their prior. So the, the pathologist would have a prior, the clinician would have a prior, and then the two groups would trade information, which would then be conditional and help them get a better uh, idea. And we're losing that. It's called demystifying medicine. There you go. <laughs> Dr. Vardakovsky. I, I think uh, one of the uh, specialties of medicine that deals with probabilities all the time and needs um, perhaps more critical approach to it is in oncology. No patient that we walk into a room is expecting to tell them that they have a probability of dying of 100% or being cured of 100%. And so what you're suggesting of having categories partitioned is really a very uh, Gauss curve in oncology. We cannot tell the patient ever that cisplatinum is going to produce a response, um, even though we know that there is a probability of 90% response. I think that's absolutely true, and I think that's just that it's more um, it's more urgent, immediate, and impactful in oncology. But really, every decision that's made in medicine is probabilistic, and most of them are Bayesian. And, and we just most, we don't acknowledge it very much. And I think your example is one where we, it could be helpful to be a little more transparent about that. Yeah, I would say the only, the, the only part of medicine that really does Fisher statistics in a, in a deep way is laboratory medicine where you get a curve and you see you cut off the 5% confidence limit and it's, you know, using the Gaussian curve. I, that's about the only one that I can think of that works that way. But then we don't use it, but then we use it in a Bayesian sense, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks. So um, both of you suggest the importance of looking at the individual uh, when interpreting the data. So uh, I think that, that's a big difference between genetic, genetic testing for a patient with a possible phenotype and uh, for a um, healthy people. Uh -huh. So that's the most the big difference. So I think based on your reasoning, it seems that uh, if one has good history, so one with have well known family history, then there's no need to do genetic testing at all. Is that right? 
That's very good. <laughs> if, if somebody has a family history, no, somebody does not have, have no family history. Well, uh, you know, I think the the Bayesian argument would go as follows, which is their prior probability of carrying a pathogenic variant is low, but we actually know what that is. It's around one to two percent, depending on. So, so you're starting with a low probability, but then if you condition that on saying, you know what, we found a variant that has an ext that is extremely well established as being a pathogenic variant, it now flips that 50 to one to more like a, uh, more, more like a, uh, a, a one in 10 or a one in 50 sort of probability. So, um, but what that underscores is that if you do a genetic test on somebody who has no family history and has no disease, you, you had better only call in them variants that you have a very high certainty is going to cause disease. And that's one of the reasons why um, uh, uh, the recommendation from the American College of Medical Genetics has been that if you find things in people that are incidental findings, don't even report VUSs. Don't eat, don't muddy the water with VUSs. Either you either you're quite clear that it's pathogenic, or just don't say anything about it. And that's an attempt to get at what you're describing. It's not a complete solution, but it's kind of a partial solution. But you, you're right. I mean, the other sort of scary statistic, though, is you can look at it upside down, and I, you know these numbers better than I do, but if you look at people who are tested for hereditary cancer syndromes, and I think uh, breast and ovarian, this is known best for, of the people who have the mutation, are found to have a mutation because of an atypical early presentation, about half of them have a completely unconvincing family history which is a very scary number. So that's a great example of an error that we are currently making in medicine and everyone accepts it as being okay, which is we believe that the family history is a good screen for hereditary cancer. And when it's positive, it is a good, it is a good um, indicator. When it's negative, it's not as good as we would like to think it is. And we're fooling ourselves if we think that if everybody would just have a complete family history, all this would go away, because it won't. No. So the, the, the data I have on that is in hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, about half of the patients, about 50% of the patients who have a clear pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant have no family history. In prostate cancer, it's even worse. The family history is a terrible predictor of who's going to be carrying an homologous recombination repair gene mutation that we now know is uh, is found significantly in particularly early onset prostate cancer or metastatic. There's a nice New England Journal paper that looked at metastatic prostate cancer, a strikingly high incidence of BRCA1 and 2 and PALB2 and other uh, uh, HR uh, gene mutations. So, I mean, I, I've practiced genetics for 40 years, so it pains me to have to say that when I get a good positive family history, I use it. Negative family history means almost nothing. And, and part of the reason is that particularly nowadays, SIP ships are small. People move away from where their grandparents live. They actually don't know what happened to their grandparents. So a negative family history can be, I come from a huge family. I know everybody. You know, I have 15 uncles on this side, 20 aunts and uncles on that side. Nobody had this. Versus my parents were, 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 were only children. Both of those are going to be interpreted as no family history, but they mean completely different things. And it's also good to know who your parents are. It is good to know who your parents are. It's nice. Are there any other well, questions? For better or worse. <laughs> yes. Oops. Thank you both for very clear presentations. I have a question that you might have answered previously in other questions, but I just want to ask to clarify it. Let's say there's um, an individual with um, the phenotypes and the clinical biomarkers um, that are consistent with an autosomal recessive condition, and you do um, next-gen sequencing, identify one variant a in question. a very, um, uh, what is the word, uh, a good gene, can you, how appropriate to assume that with the current technology, 
the other variant might be in Pomoda region or other regions that are not being well sequenced? That's a great question. And what, and what that really is pointing to is um, uh, what, what, what Les was, was really referring to, and that is once you, once you end up with a probability based on the variant itself, you then look at the clinical situation. And what that's going to happen is in the situation you described, it's going to shift the likelihood that there's two abnormal alleles present in that individual to a very high level. And there's a letter that I would I would suggest you read just because it's it, it it's a lot of fun to read it because the letter is just flaming it's like, like the the fire jumps off off the page it's by Steve Cedarbaum. I knew it was going to be Cedarbaum. Steve <laughs> Cedarbaum, who's this wonderful <laughs> metabolic physician yeah. from Los Angeles, and he wrote a letter to the Gen Genetics and Medicine in December of 2015, I think, where he said, you know, you guys in the laboratory, I don't know what's the matter with you. I send you a blood sample from a patient who clearly has phenylketonuria. And you look at the, at the phenylalanine hydroxylase gene. And there's one variant that's a known pathogenic variant, and the other you're calling it a VUS. How in heaven's name can this be a VUS? You know the patient has PKU. It's clear that the other variant has to be causing the disease. And the argument there is, look, the VUS was called on the, what we know about the variant. As a clinician, you then can take that information and go the next step and say, I know this patient has PKU. Take that exact same situation, but now make it a disease in which there are 30 different genes that can cause this condition. And in fact, there may be even 30 more that, that we don't even know about. Being able to make that leap, that that variant of uncertain significance must be involved in the disease is you really can't do it in that situation, really. So uh, you, you raise really, it's an interesting point. It's part of, the, part of the reason I think that we're even trying to put in a formal framework for how to apply patient's phenotype. Because how the patient presents, what disease you're talking about, how many genes are involved in causing that disease, uh, all play a role in exactly what you've described. But take a look at Cedar Bob's letter. It's really, uh, it's really fun to read. Except uh, w w wear your sunglasses when you read it. <laughs> the, uh, that, and that was a great example, I can use this one, of, of you just used great Bayesian reasoning skills, right? Because you have a, the prior probability of the variant is what it is, and you then pose a scenario where a patient, and, and your scenario was the patient has the metabolic disease, <coughs> right? And then you ask the question, what's the likelihood there's an undetected second variant? And you can actually measure that because you know how many um, con biochemically confirmed people have two variants or one across huge research studies. You can measure that. And then I would ask you, what do you think if you find a person who's healthy, who has one variant in that gene, what's the likelihood that they have a second cryptic pathogenic allele? And you would probably say, oh, it's very small, right? There's no, no one would go look for it because you're using Bayesian reasoning, right? Exactly what you want to be doing. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I want to thank uh, both of you for stimulating us. And, thank uh, you for having us. Thanks. <laughs>